last two sessions for today, uh, language and applications. So we'll have three speakers, and the first one is uh, David Winery, and he will discuss the session vision of the, of the attribute bootstrap, bootstrap aggregation in quantum machine learning. Thank you very much. Okay, so the purpose of this talk is uh, to set out a generalized strategy for attributes bootstrap aggregation. Uh, so this is the work of myself, David Windridge, and uh, Raja Magarajan at the uh, University of Middlesex in London. So this falls squarely within the area of machine learning, quantum machine learning. Um, so this is a relatively new field subset of quantum computing. Uh, there have been some notable uh, successes to date. Um, perhaps the most emblematic one being the, uh, the quantum support vector machine of Robentrost, Mazzoni, and, and Lloyd. Uh, but there are a number of other algorithms. There is uh, K-means, uh, unsupervised clustering algorithm. You've got quantum uh, principal component analysis, quantum neural networks, quantum decision trees, and so on. So almost the full, pan the full panoply of machine learning uh, has been transferred in some form or other to uh, the quantum domain. Um, I'll be focusing on the supervised learning problem. So this is the problem of how one learns uh, an optimal decision uh, hyperplane or decision boundary in some feature space. So you have you're presented with a set of objects existing within a feature space, so a set of vectors. So these are objects with measurements associated with them. And you have a set of labels uh, associated with those objects. And the goal is to try and generalize, uh, to find a generalized boundary that allows you then to classify novel uh, vectors that don't as yet have labels. So the typical setup is X, uh, uh, the vectors of each space y, the labels. Uh, Everything is reducible to the binary problem, so the labels are plus one, minus one. <coughs> so, within the area of machine learning, there is uh, ensemble machine learning. And this is the, the science of how one combines classifiers uh, in order to get a better decision than you would get from the best individually performing classifier. And the combination can be uh, through any number of different methods, simplest uh, of which will be majority voting. Um, and what I'll be looking at here is bootstrap aggregation, or bagging for short. Um, and this is a method of producing bootstrapped ensembles of classifiers for decision combination, hopefully producing uh, a better decision. So uh, to begin at the beginning, the classical support vector machine uh, seeks to learn when given a set of vectors, labeled vectors, they were labeled uh, red and, and blue, seeks to uh, find an optimal decision hyperplane. It's not always the case in classification that this needs to be a, a hyperplane, it can be an arbitrary boundary, and we'll come on to that later. But basically you want to select the, the best generalizing uh, web by setting this feature space. And it does this by maximizing the margin. This is the distance uh, from the hyperplane to the, uh, the opposing labeled objects. And maximizing the margin selects a unique hyperplane. Um, the hyperplane itself is characterized by a couple of parameters. There's an orientation weight vector omega and bias offset, which is the, uh, the distance from the origin. So this is uh, solved as a Lagrangian optimization problem. Um, we're trying to minimize a particular quantity with respect to a constraint. Um, now, it turns out that uh, the magnitude of omega squared is inversely related to the margin. So by minimizing that quantity, we're maximizing the margin. So we're trying to maximize the margin subject to this constraint which is essentially a constraint on the classification performance. It's always positive uh, for correctly classified objects in the, in the training sample. Um, this particular form is known as the soft margin uh, variance of the support vector machine, where you introduce certain slack parameters, C, 
that uh, serve to allow you to uh, deviate from having a completely linearly separable problem, which is never going to be the case in practice, or at least it would be trivially easy if, if all problems were linearly separable. So it's more generally the case that you solve this in the dual Lagrangian form, uh, and it's convenient in the sense that the slack parameters disappear, so you don't need to worry about those individually, and you're solving instead uh, in terms of the KKT multipliers, alpha. So these are Lagrangian multipliers. Uh, so we're now maximizing quantities subject to a different constraint. And it's very apparent in this form that when you perform the optimization, the majority of these uh, alpha values tend very rapidly towards zero leaving only a, a, a relatively few, a very sparse set of non-zero uh, alphas. And these are the support objects from which it, it gets its name. Um, another point to note in the dual form is that you've got this term uh, x transpose x. This is the gram matrix, the matrix of inner products uh, between the training objects. So when uh, the solution is arrived at, you can see that the support objects essentially of defining the boundary. And this is what gives the support vector machine its power. It's purely discriminative. You're not uh, so much in danger of overfitting. You're not wasting the parameters, characterizing the distribution of objects uh, other than those on the, on the boundary or on the margin. Um, which brings us to kernel methods. More of, uh, the support vector machine is most often used in a kernelized form. Uh, kernels are motivated from areas like genomics where it's much more natural to compare objects than it is to find a feature space for objects. Um, so in genomics you have natural distances like uh, mutation distances, least common ancestor distances, whereas working out what feature space uh, DNA strand will belong to is a little bit more complex. So kernel methods use a similarity function, so your input essentially is a matrix, um, and it induces an embedding space via a, a feature map. Um, I'll explain this process uh, in terms of the, uh, the dual form. So where we see this term, the grand matrix, in uh, a machine learning problem, that's an indication that we can kernelize uh, the problem which means we can substitute, we're free to substitute the ground matrix for any kernel function that obeys the MERSA conditions. Now, MERSA conditions are fairly relaxed. They require <coughs> things like uh, positive semi-definiteness guarantees. But essentially, there are a lot of kernels. And what is possible to show <coughs> is that a kernel is equivalent to an inner product in some space uh, with a feature map phi. So if the training vectors are in your uh, input space, uh, then these are feature mapped into some alternative space where the kernel is, uh, is an inner product. The beauty of the method is that you never actually need to compute phi. It simply drops out of the equations, provided that your kernel obeys the, uh, the KKT conditions. And there are lots of useful kernels. A very common one is the radial basis function. Uh, this guarantees linear separability. So you see here, your input space, um, it's not a linear separable problem. The RBF induces uh, linear separability. So very useful. Um, the quantum support vector machine proposed by Remontros et al. Um, uses a, a least squares re-implementation of that classical score vector machine approach. And the problem is set up, the way I set up the problem is some function f of the bias offset of the decision hyperparameter and set of uh, weight vectors that uh, acts to give you the, uh, the decision labels. So the kernel matrix appears in there, k. There's also this term gamma, which is uh, a trade-off between the sport vector machine optimization, classification accuracy. So what we want are essentially given k and y, we want to determine the, the b and uh, the bias offset and the weights of the hyperparameter. 
So we have to invert this function. So uh, Roman Charles et al. use uh, quantum matrix inversions to do this very efficiently, and they obtain a solution state uh, in terms of uh, basis states indexing over the training vectors uh, with an additional basis state for the carrying information of, of, of bias on the bias offset. Um, to actually utilize that, uh, it needs to be converted into a query oracle. So uh, another qubit is introduced uh, which relates to the actual uh, training vectors themselves, uh, the magnitude here. And uh, this then is the oracle for which we want to uh, apply a query state to determine what class this vector should be allocated. And the query state has the same form uh, indexing over the, uh, the training vectors and the, uh, and the vector of interest that we want to classify. Uh, the classification is carried out via a swap test uh, so you can answer to construct uh, this state, measure it in the, uh, the zero minus one basis, and you get a problem. And the probability, if, if it's greater than half, being that state, suggests you're in the the plus one class. Uh, if it's less than uh, half, it, you're in the minus one class. So. The standard approach to classical bootstrap aggregation bagging uh, involves the selection, the random sampling with replacement of D groups uh, from M training samples. Training uh, classifiers individually on those bootstrap samples and combining the output by uh, some form of decision fusion. Um, Perhaps I'll skip through this, but it's possible to show that the effectiveness of uh, ensemble methods comes about for a variety of different reasons. Uh, you can break down the mean square error of an estimation terms uh, of the bias various covariance of uh, the collective classifiers. And for each, so you've got three different routes in effect for improving performance by combining classifiers. Um, each individual classifier, though, has a bias variance trade-off. So bias is the expected discrepancy from the Bayes optimal classifier. The variance is variance with respect to train set permutation. So the bias variance trade-off is like deciding on the flexibility of the classifier, uh, the structural risk of the classifier. And what it's possible to show you by this kind of analysis is that Bagging improves performance primarily through variance reduction, so it's inherently more effective on low bias classifiers. So these are things like decision trees, neural networks, and so on. It is not so effective on support vector machines. Um, they're very high bias, uh, very low variance, because uh, if you're only if you're classifying on the basis of uh, those objects on the uh, the support objects, then clearly you can permute the rest of the the training set and it won't have any effect on the outcome. So people have looked at different strategies for uh, introducing uh, appropriate variance into bias reduction into uh, spore vector machines. One strategy is to look at the kernel. If you've got three parameters in the kernel, uh, like the power in a polynomial kernel, you can adjust this, try and induce some flexibility in the classifier. But the best overall strategy uh, for support vector machines uh, for bootstrap aggregation is attributes bootstrap, uh, bootstrap aggregation, or the random subspace method. In other words, rather than selecting from the, the training data for, to get your bootstrap sample, you're selecting from the features uh, of your input data set. So in terms of this function f that we want to invert, we've got some other term. Uh, we've got uh, p acting uh, as a characteristic function, selecting uh, features, which acts on the kernel alone. So this suggests straight away a quantum analogy. It's very much like a, a projector. So 
Basically, what we have are a set of projectors to create our bootstrap samples. So the standard uh, classical uh, bootstrap aggregation approach um, chooses S uh, individual classifiers, different uh, projectors, if you like, um, from the, the end training objects with end features, so selecting from the end features. And then we combine uh, and sum over the, the end result. So, uh, so basically we're training, we're training S support vector machines and summing over them. So putting that into uh, the Remetrial set all terminology, basically we've got this solution state, which is the ensemble sum. Um, so we've got an additional term here, we've got this additional summation. Uh, we've got these projectors on the, the basis states. Um, but the thing to note here is that we've got these sets alpha, which are now indexed both by the uh, training vectors and the, the sets of, uh, of characteristic functions that we're using to, uh, to create the bootstrap sample. But the thing to note is that these alphas uh, define, as they're given, they define uh, a particular training uh, or a particular decision hyperplane in of some dimensionality equivalent to the, the Hamming weight of the characteristic function minus one uh, within its appropriate subspace. But we can also look at that as being embedded in the, the wider uh, feature space, in which case, these are at the full dimensionality of the hyperplane, so dimensionality n minus one, provided we go through some sort of author complementation process uh, with the null space of the characteristic function. So basically what this boils down to is that we can treat the projected versions of the training vectors as being equivalent to the full set within the, quanta, within the query oracle Provided that uh, we make um, a few ch assumptions about uh, the alphas, the, the actual values themselves are unchanged. And we can see this by setting um, appropriate values. If we create a value alpha prime, summing over the ensemble set of uh, alphas, uh, and same for the bias offsets, define x prime, a uh, new magnitude, then basically we can show that it's possible to get rid of all of these difficult projectors and arrive at something that has precisely the same form as the Revantros et al. support vector machine query oracle. So what this means is the basis is identical to the standard quantum support vector machine. Uh, the oracle has the same overall form as the original. So essentially, the individual classifications are, are no longer resolvable in the swap measurement. What you get is the ensemble decision. And moreover, you've done this without additional logic gates, at least as regards the classification. So essentially, you're getting this for free. You're stabilizing the classifier, the support vector machine, by leveraging uh, the attribute bootstrap aggregation and getting a stabilized version of the support vector machine without any extra machinery. So just to summarize that, um, we've implemented a version of attributes, bootstrap aggregation, um, using the Reventrost as our uh, support vector machine. So this is stabilizing your classification, uh, utilizing the, the uh, quantum superposition so that your measurement is now an ensemble decision. Um, this works because of the linear decomposability of the decision boundaries within the embedding space. So again, you can use arbitrary kernels on this in principle. Um, it can, in fact, therefore be applied irrespective of the classifier type. So although it's built on the, uh, the Roman Trust et al. model, it's potentially uh, more extensible than that. Um, so you're getting these performance benefits, the stabilization for free, on top of the existing benefits you get for quantum support vector machines, which is an exponential speed up. Um, 
So in the to do category, essentially it remains to implement arbitrary kernels. Um, Reverend Charles said I'll discuss uh, polynomial kernels and variants of these. And these are the most natural uh, kernels to implement in the quantized support, support vector machine. But potentially, there are a lot more kernels that one could apply this to. So I think I'll end it there. Perfect timing. Thank you. Have you tried it in practice? Have you no, no, no. This is uh, this is all hypothetical at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, and uh, probably I understand something not right. But uh, unitary evolution is rather restrictive, and uh, I'm, my understanding of neural networks is that you can just use transitional probabilities and matrix to go from one vector to another, and this is. They are not restricted. Am I right? Don't you afraid that there will be other conditions for quantum case? I think it's quite a natural translation. I mean, in um, kernel methods in general, uh, maybe not specifically neural networks, but in, in kernel methods, uh, as an approach to generalized machine learning, you're already in a helmet space. So actually, the quantum analogy, you know, unitary transformations of vectors, is very, very natural, I think, already, which is why I guess a lot of people start thinking very quickly of, of machine learning, quantum machine learning approaches, as soon as quantum computing had, had been formalized as a notion. So I think um, yeah, it, it's actually very natural, and uh, uh, I would suggest. Yes. Uh so you're doing all this sophisticated modeling um, to get kind of optimal fits, and then you've got this bagging sort of thing, which is pretty primitive. Well, it's provably fair, provably stabilized. And if you go back to us. But, but there's no theory for it. Everything else you have is this. This is the theory for it. So <laughs> you can break down the mean square error. Uh, for uh, an estimator of class uh, in terms of breakdown to bias variance, bias variance covariance. So basically, if you can reduce this or this or this, then you're going to reduce the mean square error of your estimator. So, you know, this is why bagging works. Okay, this is the ensemble. Uh, but why is the average uh, that? that F bar, why is that an optimal thing to do? Well, it just, it's it essentially works. because you're, yeah, you're, you, you're, if you've got uncorrelated errors as a result of this bootstrap ensemble, they're cancelling out. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it very simply. So, you know, uncorrelated error cancellation is something you're getting from averaging. So if you're, if you've been prone to overfitting, for instance, you, know, you can cancel out those errors but that doesn't show it's optimal. It just gets on our errors. No, it's, it's not necessarily it's optimal. A, it's a good thing to do. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's a bit of stabilizing. Um, I mean, optimality, I think you'd actually have to look inside the classifier. But given your classifier, uh, <coughs> you, know, you can show that certain kinds of ensemble are, are optimal under certain conditions. Other questions? Yeah, my my question is, um, <laughs> or, oh, sorry? It's okay. You're a design model boy. Ah, okay, you go first. <laughs> Just two, two more questions. One is, I didn't get um, what the main thrust of this is. But with the quantum approaches, is it for a speed up in the algorithms, or is this the hope that you'll get better um, empirical performance on the ground? That's the first question. And the second is, uh, I think uh, uh, this is more of a comment, but we, we did some work, not in like this, but in terms of uh, classification, uh, in, in, the, in the sense that we felt that what quantum uh, cognition could bring to this was in the area of um, the, the classification of the labels. Because I don't know if you, I think in the Roy is 121578 collection, I think ship and oil. These were categories that a lot of the learners could deal with very, very well. And when we went back to the original 
work to get those classes, but it was hard for the humans as well. Mm. So this is where we thought that the quantum models with the, were with the, um, with the interference effect. For those particular sort of uh, categories, that's where this sort of work could probably best be applied. It's certainly very interesting when you've got some ambiguity in the categories. Yeah. I mean, th this is meant to be a direct implementation of yeah, the yeah. classical spore vector machine, so it's giving yeah. it hard outputs. Uh, it's only as good as the, the training samples you're feeding it. I mean, yeah. they've been misenabled by, by humans. Yeah. There's nothing you can do to recover from that. Yeah. Um, but these are very interesting questions, looking at the actual categories themselves, and that, that may itself be something that, that, that uh, quantum theory can bring to the table. But this is simply quantum computing speed up of existing classical algorithms. And the question actually was similar line. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because what you try to like what this machine learning support machines and all these like classificators try to do is to mimic or like reach human capacities because we can we can classify so we are the, the like, ultimate classifiers to be like automatized and some experiments in, in psychology show that the feature space might not be a metric space because uh, some like for example the, the any metric spaces must respect some axioms like the triangular inequality, which is that, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. and some research, like, in psychological experiments show that we do not uh, commit to, like, the space, the feature space that doesn't necessarily hold the axioms of a metric space, and then you build the, the theory of this theory, support vector machines, and like many other theories, kernel based so start from scratch from a metric space so then they, they lose the chance of, of having some more general geometrical structure well in fact I mean you're completely free to choose your metric I mean you're given a bunch of train vectors and labels it's not actually saying anything at all about the metric so the the uh, supervised learning problem as formulated essentially leaves you free to to choose your metric um, but not free of like you, the metric. The metric is axiomatized. That's what I mean. Like, it's going to be a distance. In the end. Like the, the element that the elements are distant in space in the feature space. The distance exists in the same way that distance exists in objects in in our real space. You've got to have some locality assumption that you have an awful lot of latitude as to. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, there's nothing explicitly metric about the sport vector machine, you know, it's just inner products. Mm. Uh, the, 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 as long as those exist, I mean, the actual implicit embedding is, and this is another reason why they're so powerful. I mean, you know, you don't have, if you're modeling, if you're, if you're using a generative classifier, then you do have to start making metric assumptions. Uh, and this is one of the great advantages, you know, the kernel is, it's not choosing a metric, but it's, it's, it's choosing your entire space in which you're doing the classification. And again, you've got a completely free choice. So, you know, you, you do what works. Yeah. You, know, you, treat, you can treat it in a completely engineering sense of just find the kernel that gives you the best generalizing performance for any given classification problem that you have. No, it seems still to me, maybe I'm stubborn, but it still, it still seems to me that the <coughs> that the metric choice, regardless of the metric in itself, regardless of the norm, let's say, that we create, still, I have the feeling that it's a, a, a very big uh, constraint to have, like, for example, you could work, it is possible in principle to work in more general, means in cost space, where not necessarily distances are positive or, you know, like, yeah. So certainly if you're using a, a generative classifier, I mean, people have experimented with a lot of different metrics. You know, Malanovis metric is, is often very effective. Um, maybe, I, I don't know, I, I can't recall anyone having used a Minkowski metric, but you know, perhaps it would work in, in, in certain circumstances. I mean, you can also use a dissimilarity or similarity functions that are not metric. Right? Yes. And that's what I was and that's to say. as simple as this. 
you don't have to use a metric. No, 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 sort of no. Well, that I think would answer yeah. his concerns. What he says, psychology is full of examples. Psychology full of examples of all kinds of dissimilarity mm -hmm. measures that are not metric. Yeah. Right. So, so the relevant thing here, here are the MERS conditions. So these are the set of constraints that you're, you're comparing. So you've got some comparison function. You know, what you're saying is, you know, I'm comparing two objects and giving you a real number. Mm. Um, you're free to choose anything, provided that it obeys most of the conditions. And they're not very constraining. You know, it's pretty much just a guarantee of positive semi-definiteness of your kernel matrix. If you can guarantee that, then, you know, you're free to use it. So, like, like I say, you know, these can be very esoteric comparisons, like the you know, genome genome comparison metrics, you know, mutation distance, least common, common ancestor distances, you know, come up with anything you want as long as it's satisfied. So there's maybe a, a slight relationship between the triangular inequality and Mercer's conditions, but, but most of it's just positive semi-definiteness, which is a lighter condition. Yeah. Okay, thank you very okay. much. Thank and you. Uh, let's have the